Thank you. We have, yeah, we're you. running a little behind, but if you want to stay and ask a few oh, questions, really? we would totally love it. We have a portable mic. We would totally oh, love it. So, thank you. Davey, start. Well, you're the only one here who didn't already know. <laughs> <laughs> this is Davey, everybody. Hi. Hey, Davey. Hi. Thank you so much. Uh, my question is about things. Y'all said so much about something. And I'd love to know some more about things. Uh, specifically, Tyrone, in response to your thinking about commodification, I'm curious about reading the poem as a critique of commodification and thinking about things moving from the quotidian, like how are things, to the commodified, my house is full of things. And thinking about this in like a like Fordist planned obsolescence moment of just like the massive proliferation of stuff and thinking about what kinds of things things get to be? So in the, in the poem, um, the way I read, um, read it in relationship to the issue of commodification is that, um, so one of the things I was thinking about is Bigger Thomas from Native Son, mm -hmm. uh, that moment when he's walking through the neighborhoods and seeing all the things that he has, and his people in his community will never have. They, don't, they can't get those things. But of course, the great thing about the novel and, and the poem too is that, and I think Billy Joe referred to this, is that nonetheless, you get to see those things that you can't have through TV, through television, through newspapers, ads, and, and so forth. And so the particular hell in which the narrator finds, finds himself and the others is that not only do they not have things, but those things are presented to them as you know, sort of phantasms that they can never grasp, they can see, but they can never grasp. So that's one way to think of it in that way. But of course, that's thinking about it in way of desire, that we want those things. But as that line about the cable TV suggests too, and other lines, that there's really nothing in those things. So the, just to go back to what Alden said at the very beginning, there's something in the way of things themselves that also is a kind of, um, that hinders us from you know being becoming who and what we are, as he says, toward the end are going to be, you know when we when we're going to find happiness and so forth. Thank you for the question, Davy. Anybody else have a question? Eric's got one. Get the mic. To, wait, well, let's get the mic to you, Eric. <laughs> so this is really more of a request for pedagogical suggestions. So we're going to begin uh, several years of seminars on the Beats and the Black Ox movement. Mm. And very exciting, it's part of a larger thing we're doing on looking back at the 50 years ago. But this whole panel reminds me of how incredibly much, and this, even just with Baraka, there's all this incredible work from, from later on. So how do we teach all these wonderful people in a moment, in that bubble mm -hmm. of the Beats and the Black Arts movement with the knowledge that so many of these people went on to do such other things. How do we, how do we inform that within the spectrum of still teaching the moment? That's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> That's it's why you're going to answer it. To look at it from the point of view of looking at the moment and then teaching how these other things come out of it as opposed to... Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which could be what the what you teach later, <laughs> but it does seem important for you to say, this is a very important moment, but other things grow out of it, yeah. and very rich and complicated things. And you talk, you can talk about the way things move in and out. So you have the Umbra group that leads into right. the Black Arts Movement in, in right. some ways. Um, you can, you know, in Baraka's autobiography, he talks about the organization for young men, which is kind of a parallel thing. And you can mm -hmm. talk about how these things moved into black arts and then moved out into other things later on. And you can do the same kind of thing with, with Black Mountain and Bead and so forth and so on by showing these, you know, sort of shifting. Uh, actually, uh, I'm going to be talking to MLA about Baraka and, and the journal Culture. Culture is part of that moment. It's a good place to look at where all these groups are coming together, mm -hmm. fighting it out on the pages of the magazine, mm -hmm. for example. You know, I remember there's this. Uh, Review Jerome Rothenberg uh, writes attacking, I forget who it was, Merwin or something. No, not Merwin, but anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, they really did fight these things out in those journals in a way that's a little rarer today. Now, we, I guess we do it online, but it, those fights can be one place to look at the later developments, too. But it could be fun to teach. Now, it's a series of courses you're teaching? So this, this is um, an interdisciplinary um, 
series of seminars that uh -huh. bring faculty together from many departments. I mean, obviously our English department, but mm -hmm. really from many departments across and, mm -hmm. and allow us to invite people like yourself, William, to come and give a talk on a subject that would be related to the seminar yeah. series. It does seem like something would be fun. With, you know, you could teach a moment and then some in the in the class or the seminar, some you can say, and let's look forward. Let's see what happens, uh, how that develops. And even, you know, it'd be great to teach a whole different series of courses, but just have that moment presented, that future moment. Yeah. And, and some question you could, you could ask is, how does this relate back to, uh, to black so arts? don't be afraid to go there. No. Don't yeah, well, in fact, right. but, don't, but you can't ignore that moment. Right. The, yes. fact, the fact of it's interdisciplinary gives you this incredible opportunity because, for example, right. you look at the formation of the AACM in Chicago and yeah. its relationship to what's going on with the black arts, you know, Phil Coran opening his theater and so forth, and then you can look at where all of that energy went in the subsequent years, and you can do the same thing in painting and sculpture, you can do the same thing in drama. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it really does give you a tremendous opportunity because you are bringing all the arts together in that. I think we have time for two more questions, and we need a mic in the back there. Thank you. You're talking about the, the Amina. You're talking about Amina. Talking right? Amina. Yeah, she was the Calvin's yeah. College. Before. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. And he knew he was never going to be accepted by the uh, white society for what he was doing. Mm -hmm. And he talked about his motivation to keep working. Well, again, that's 40 or 50 different questions. Just following mm -hmm. the name change is kind of fun, and, and scholars seem to have a lot of trouble with it. Uh, in looking at culture, for example, I see that um, there's a Denise Levertoff part that has his name L E small R, hmm. but it's headed by L E big R <laughs> in the, on the same page. Um, in the autobiography, he talks about wondering why, as a college student, he went to Leroy, you know, trying to Frenchify it and so forth. And, and of course, the beat friends knew him as Roy, and then he becomes Imamu, but then he drops the Imamu and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, by the time he names himself Amiri Baraka, he knows that the white literary establishment is not terribly interested in Actually, I'll point to one thing. I don't want to take too much time, but the Asilomar Conference in 1965 or so, one of the first national conferences on, on black literature, happens out in California, sponsored by Berkeley Extension. He's on a panel with Gwendolyn Brooks. And at the close of that panel, and you can hear this on a Pacifica mm -hmm. tape that's still available, at the end of the panel, there are all these white critics who get up one by one mm -hmm. and try to get Gwendolyn Brooks to denounce him because they they want no part of this crazy beat aesthetic. They're willing to accept the Pulitzer Prize winning Gwendolyn Brooks, right. and Gwendolyn's having none of it. <laughs> she says, actually, I've learned quite a bit from Mr. Jones. <laughs> That's a fantastic story. Uh, we have time for one more question. Theodore, you must. Teddy, I could t I'm just watching you the whole time. Um, oh, thank you. Um, I'm glad you brought up this symposium, these symposiums and interdisciplinary things because one of the things um, because of the work I did with Baraka I always tried to find work that he did talking about the visual arts mm -hmm. in his essays that he wrote about the visual arts and his involvement with visual artists um, and I think that could be a good aspect to talk about also his you know with um, with the so called outsider artists Two that he wrote about later on with the um, Souls Grown Deep books that he um, wrote large essays for. Um, so looking at the visual arts is um, really something that a lot of people don't talk about that he did, except for in the International Review of African American Art. There was a section there talking about his involvement with visual artists too. And then I think somebody, this, this is a book I wanted to promote too, if you don't mind. Um, Margot Crawford's new book. Okay. Yeah, read it. Read it's, the title. it's titled "Post you know, Black Post Blackness: The Black Arts Movement and 20th Century Aesthetics." And what she does here, which is really important, which I want to do, and what I'm thinking about is how does the black arts move the visual artists that have been influenced by the black arts movement, you know? And um, there's a lot of there's not enough written about that, so. 
Anybody want to comment yeah. on Baraka and the visual arts? Well, I'll tell another story. Um, <laughs> everyone who knew Baraka always saw him scribble. But like, I He's think a, a, lot of us, a lot of us did not know just how extensive this was. I did not know that until I discovered there was an Amiri Baraka art show going on at a gallery in Venice, California. Um, but yes, he was always involved. One of, the, one of my prized possessions hanging on my wall is a work by Larry Rivers for Amiri Baraka, signed by both of them. He was really? Still, yeah, he was still mm -hmm. Leroy Jones there. So at every, there's no stage of his career where he's not intimately involved with the visual arts. Mm -hmm. And again, this, as you say, this is a side of him. Um, I don't know if you know Ted Feeling's uh, book of Middle Passage drawings. Mm -hmm. you know, um, mm -hmm. Baraka was always mm -hmm. very supportive of that kind of work. The most obvious example that Margot has written about this is the book In Our Terribleness. Right. Which is still a wonderful, Billy. wonderful book. Yeah. yeah. Billy Abernathy, if I was the yeah. name before, yeah. Right. right. So, yes. <laughs> thank you for the question. Thanks, everybody, for coming to this. And thank, thank you to the three of you. This was, this was a great, great thing. So, let's hear it for you. Oh, thank you for the audience. <laughs> right. You can applaud yourself. <laughs>